went to the door. He tried to pick that lock, and he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and he couldn't get out. And in exasperation and frustration, he leaned on the door, and it opened. You know what? It's pretty hard to unlock a lock that's already unlocked. And that's the whole point of this verse. You have been freed in Jesus Christ. He's writing to the Galatians. So why would you go back to law-keeping? Why would you go back to keeping all the rules if all it takes is believing in Jesus Christ because Jesus did everything? Jesus paid the price on the cross. Jesus freed you. So then why would you try to add to that faith anything because you're already free? You're already free. Well, the passage begins with that. In chapter uh, 5, verse 1, it says, For it is for freedom that Christ sets you free. And where we pick up today in verse 13, it says, uh, You, my brothers, were called to be free. You were called to be free. And the first thing I want to talk about is being free from the law. The fact that we're free from the law does not make us outlaws. All right? I'm driving down the road. I don't see any speed limit sign. I say, okay, must be no speed limit. So I decide, oh, my odometer says I can go 140. I push it. <laughs> All right, now, now you know I'm breaking the law. But just because there is, it, it, there's no, I have no law, no sign, doesn't mean I become a lawbreaker. It's just the opposite. Because I'm free, I'm not free to be a lawbreaker. And at the same time, he says, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. It's not like when you become a Christian, you, you, you're, Jesus sets you free so that you're like 007. You're like James Bond. You have a license to kill. It's not like, okay, now that I've, I've been set free from Jesus, that I, I, I'm free from the law, so now I can just go out and kill. Or I can go out and commit any sin I want. It's not like that at all. Years ago, I, I was driving the church bus to pick up some kids for a winter retreat, and uh, one young man jumped on the bus, and, and I said, okay, I always had to check, do you got your money? Are you going to be able to you know, go on the retreat? He said, oh, yeah, no sweat. Now, the retreat was 20 bucks. I said, you got 20 bucks. He said, oh, no, I did better than that. I got 40. I said, you got 40? He said, oh, yeah, I got, I got 20 for the retreat, 20 to spend. I said, how'd you do that? He said, well, I told my mom the retreat was $40. <laughs> well, I said, no, no, you can't do that. He said, oh, no, no, I got it covered. I already prayed and asked God to forgive me. <laughs> you see, he was using his freedom as a license to do wrong. And he's just saying, no, 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 that's not the way this works. You are not freed. He said, do not use your freedom to indulge in sinful behavior, gratifying your sinful desires, your sinful nature. He says, that's not what you are free to do. He says, instead, rather, he says, serve one another in love. God set you free so that you would express love. Love, he says, I am free from the law so that I might love. Jesus actually said, they'll know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. Your love for one another. And so I've been freed to love. So the first point, if you're filling in all the blanks in the bulletin, the first one is the Spirit enables us to fulfill the law of love. He goes on in the very next verse and he says this, for the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. God writes the law on your heart. He writes it on your heart. So that it's not now that I have to, it's now that I want to. You, you see, it says, remember the Sabbath day, so it's, it's not that I have to go to church. All of a sudden, because he's written the law on my heart, now I want to go to church. It's not that I have to tell the truth, thou shalt not bear any false witness, but it's now that he's written a law in my heart. I, I love my neighbor, so I want to tell the truth. It, it's not simply that thou shalt not commit adultery, but, and I shall not you know, covet my neighbor's wife. It's now I, I don't want to. I want to be faithful to my spouse. I want to. God has changed me from the inside out. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying when he's changed it from the inside out, you don't have to have a whole bunch of lists. 
You love the Lord with all your heart, and you love your neighbor as yourself, and you will automatically fulfill all those commands that are written in the law. You're not a law keeper. You're just loving the Lord with all your heart. He says, the entire law summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. You say, how does that work? Come on, come on. How does that work? Well, it's like this. In the book of Romans, it says, when you accept Christ as your Savior, you're justified. That's what the term is called. You're declared righteous before God. He has made you righteous. Watch what he says. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I've been declared righteous before God. I'm no longer guilty of my sin. I'm fully pardoned, and I've been, been inherited eternal life. And, and all that goes with that, he says, God has also poured out his love in our hearts. In our hearts. I've got the love of God in my heart. When a person really genuinely knows Jesus Christ, not just doing lip service, but they genuinely have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, you're changed from the inside out. And, and so now all of a sudden you've got the love of God in your heart. And, and it says the, his, God has poured out His love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which He has given to us the moment we receive Christ as our Savior. And then what happens is that love is inside. You can't contain it. It just starts pouring out. You love your neighbor. You love your spouse. You, you, you love to work. You, know, you, you, you don't want to steal. You want to acquire your own stuff. You don't cheat on your taxes. All those things. Why? Because you love God. You love God with all your heart. That's how this works. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has taught us, it teaches us to say to no ungodly passions. All of a sudden, I, I don't know how this happens. The things I used to like, I don't like anymore. I have found this to be true. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they don't try, you don't try to lose your, your non-Christian friends. You just all of a sudden start gravitating towards Christians and good people, and all of a sudden those other, other people who have darkness, they don't like the light. They like darkness rather than light, and they abandon you. They do. That's the way it works. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. So I don't like to do what they did, so I just don't find that camaraderie there because he's changed me from the inside out. And he says to live sober or self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I live differently. See, we don't want to do what we did before we were saved because God, because we love God and others so much. It's a radical change in our lives, in our whole lifestyle. Now, the flip side is found in the next verse. The next verse just says this. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, you just live the old way. You live like you used to live, and there's no real transformation in, life, in your life. He says, watch out. You will be destroyed by each other. You guys are just going to tear yourselves up. <laughs> it's at this point that uh, he goes on. He says, not only does the Spirit enable us to fulfill the law of love, the Spirit enables us to overcome our sinful nature, our sinful nature. The key to living a victorious Christian life is found up in this little simple phrase that pops up next. So I say, live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. The word live in the Greek uh, New Testament is actually the word walk. It's a steady, constant pace. It's not a run. Uh, it's not uh, stopping. It's a steady pace. You're walking. And so the translator is putting it into our modern a uh, uh, vernacular of English that it really represents the idea we'd say, hey, you need to live this way. You need to live this way. And so he says, live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. God gave us the Spirit, poured out the love in our hearts, so it's, hey, live in faith in the Spirit. Live in that love that the Spirit has put in your heart. He says, live that way. And he says, if you do, if you live in the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, the sinful nature is what I was born with. Mm, thanks, Mom and Dad. <laughs> well, they got to thank my grandma and grandpa. <laughs> and it goes all the way back to Adam. When Adam rebelled against God, Adam and Eve, and they rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, they were constituted sinners. 
And then when they had offspring, they were constituted sinners because Adam and Eve were the entire human race. So when they, at that point, that was it. That was the entire human race. And when they fell, the whole race fell in him. And so I was born with a sinful disposition and so were you. That's why you don't have to teach a child to say no. <laughs> you do have to teach a child to share. Why? Because they're selfish by nature. It's their sinful nature. And we all have acquired that sinful nature. And, and it says, I have that sinful nature. And that sinful nature is to do, and we'll see, there's a whole list of things it wants me to do. And it wants to pull me away from Jesus. He said, but I say, live, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires, all the things that my sinful nature wants to do. Now watch the next verse. Here's the fact that there is a conflict. There's a fact of a conflict here. For the sinful nature, the old Dennis, before I accepted Jesus, that, that Dennis, desires what is contrary to the Spirit. Oh, since I got the Spirit, I got a new nature. I've been born again. I've been born of the Spirit of God. I have a new nature. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. I have a new nature. So there's a conflict going on. The old nature, the old Dennis, is in conflict with the new Dennis. What my flesh desires and what my spirit desires, they're in conflict. He says, and the Spirit is contrary to what the sinful nature does. And he says, and they are in conflict with each other. Paul even had this conflict. Romans chapter 7. I do that which I don't want to do. And that which I don't want to do, that's the very thing I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me? And then he said in the very next verse, it's the Spirit of God that delivers. That's what we need to walk by the Spirit. There's this conflict, this war going on. A teacher was uh, trying to illustrate this truth. He said, okay, you got a black dog. And you got a white dog. Black dog's a bad guy. White dog's good dog. And they get into a fight. Which one will win? And a very sharp student said, the one you feed. Which one loses? The one you starve. And that's what this past is talking about. When you get a love in your heart for the Lord and you're walking daily with the Lord and, and you've got your eyes fixed on Jesus and, and, and you're living with Jesus, you are feeding your new nature. And at the same time, you're saying no to ungodliness and worldly lusts and all that stuff. You're just naturally doing that because you're in love with Jesus and you're starving the old. I'm starving the old, Dennis. And, and then as I'm reading my Bible and praying and having concern for people, going to church, I'm being in Bible studies, as I'm giving to church, I'm reaching out to my neighbor. I'm doing all these things. My new nature is growing. This one is dying and this one is growing. I'm becoming strong. I'm walking by the Spirit. It's very practical. They are in conflict with each other. He says, so you, you do not do what you want to do. You see, when you cave into the old Dennis, I don't do what the new Dennis really wants. And that's why Paul said, man, that which I don't want to do, I do. And that which I do want to do, I don't do. What a wretched man. He says, how do I get out of this predicament? You depend on the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is always going to point you to Jesus. Always, always, always. And your relationship with him. He says, you don't do what you want What's going on is you're, 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 you're feeding the wrong nature. You're feeding the wrong nature. I want to turn to the victory principle. He says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It's not about keeping a bunch of rules. Rule keeping never made anyone spiritual. We pointed out that last week, all right, in, in the sense that does the law of monogamy make you faithful to your spouse? Or does the love in your heart make you faithful to your spouse. It's the love in your heart. Going to church, here, here's the thing, going to church. Do I go to church because I have to? That would be according to the law. I got all these rules. That's one of the things I got to do. Or do I go to church because I love Jesus and I want to? I want to. Jesus said, they'll know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. I go there because I love these people. This is God's family. I'm in God's house. Can you imagine getting married, okay, getting married to someone? And uh, let, let's say it's a second marriage for the one. They've already got children. It says, well, I love you, but mm, the kid's got to go. <laughs> How's that going to work out? That's not going to work out. But I love you, and I, I love your kids too. You see, that's what church is. We're loving one another as we love ourselves. We're the kids, Jesus' kids. 
I've been born again. You've been born again. We're the family of God. People say to me, well, I don't have to go to church. No, you don't have to. But if you're a genuine Christian, you want to. You want to. You've got this new nature. You're reading the Word. You're studying the Bible. You're praying. And you're getting together because you're being built up in your faith. And you're walking by the Spirit. And you're starving the old nature and you're feeding the new nature, and it has all, all the implications in the world. They're powerful. He says, now look at the acts of the old me, the old Dennis, the sinful Dennis. Okay, my old nature. He said, the acts of the, nature, of the old sinful nature are obvious. This is the way that person acts with sexual immorality. Goes on and he says, impurity. Both of these, some translations put it adultery and fornication. Say, you're just sexually immoral. You're gravitating to things uh, like pornography and all that kind of, the old person. Okay. He goes on and he says, and debauchery. That is a wanton lifestyle with no self-control, sexually, drugs, all that stuff. That debauchery. He goes on, idolatry. Putting, I'm putting stuff in America. It's not that we set up golden idols, but I put a car, a boat. I, I put a vacation. I, put, I have my idols that come before God. He goes on and he says, witchcraft. Now, most of us don't practice witchcraft, but we got a big problem in America. It's an opioid epidemic. The word here behind, the word witchcraft, is a sorcerer who had magical powers by using enchanting drugs. The Greek word is pharmakai, from which we get pharmacy. This, this is drug abuse, drug abuse. He said, that's the old guy. Tries to, tries to solve all his problems, not with the Spirit of God, but he tries to solve him with a drug. Most alcoholics are that way because they, they need that to get them through life. It's their crutch. They lean on it. Whereas the person who is Jesus said, I don't need the artificial. I got the real. I got Jesus. I got the real thing here. It goes on. It says hatred. And the, the, the acts are discord. I cause all kinds of problems. I'm jealous. Uh, I think it goes on and says envy has fits of rage. You know what we'd call that today? Road rage. <laughs> That's the old Dennis. Every now and then he pops in. That guy, you know, he, he cut me off. And just for a moment, sometimes longer. All right, it pops into my head. I can do better than that. I can hit that, push that accelerator down, whip around him. I can cut him off. My car's older than his. I could even hit the brakes and make him pay for it. <laughs> you see what's going on here? This is the old stuff. This, is that really where you want to live? That's what he's saying. He goes on selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions that's causing problems with people. You know that kind of person. You don't want to be that kind of person. Envy, always a cousin with jealousy. Drunkenness, okay, losing all self-control. I told you that my mom named me Dennis. After the Greek god Dionysius. The Greek god Dionysius is the god of wine and drunkenness. I said, thank you, mom. Before, before I ever got out of the hospital, you called me a drunk. <laughs> but instead, over here, you see, over here, the old Dennis would be drunkenness. But the new, new Dennis, it says, it said, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, all that lifestyle, but be filled with the Spirit. It's all artificial, all, all artificial stimulus to make you feel good. But when you're walking in the Spirit, you have something far better than the momentary happiness over here. You have, you have over here, joy. Of no matter what happens, you've got the joy of the Lord. He goes on and says, orgies. And then he says this, and the like. He could go on. He said, oh, how about, I could tell you about gossiping. I could tell you about, and he goes, he says, there's a whole bunch of things. Homosexuality, because this isn't the only vice list in the book, in, in the Bible. And what he is saying is, you got the idea here. You know what the dark side is. That dark side is just manifestation of your old sinful nature. The old man, the old sinful nature. You're just acting on it instead of the new nature. And he says, I warn you as I did before. Warning, warning, that those who live like this, it's not that you've committed that. But this is your lifestyle. That's what happens. You get into a rut. It becomes your lifestyle. You're living like this. He says, those that live like this, watch this, will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
People come to me and say, oh, I got saved like 20 years ago, whatever. And I say, what's God doing in your life now? Well, no. And I find out they're really living like this. They're living like this. God is not in their life. Come on. Do you think that was genuine and real? I'm just asking. Do you think that? No, of course you don't. If it's genuine and real, it works the love of God in your heart so you don't love that anymore. You love the stuff that's over here. It, it's an inside-out change so that you, you have behavior modification that has been done by the Spirit of God. And he says, and that is what some of you were. After making one of these vice lists, he says, that's what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's like we were a bunch of dirty dishes and uh, the pile of dirty dishes. And, and uh, he says, then you were washed. You were cleaned up. And he says, after you were washed, he says, you were sanctified. You were set apart. The clean dishes from the dirty dishes. In fact, if it's China, when we then put them, really set them apart, put them in the China cabinet so they're not even with their everyday common dishes. And, and what he is saying here is, listen, you were dirty, messed up plate and you were washed in the blood, and now you've been set apart from, by God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he has declared you, you're clean, you're clean, you're justified, you're clean, you're declared righteous, and you're put in the trophy of God's grace. And, and what he is saying is, don't live, like, don't live life dominated by the old nature. Feed the new nature. Feed the new nature. Now, it comes to the last point here, and he says this. The Spirit enables us to actually produce, to produce spiritual fruit. The key word in the passage here is the word but. In contrast to the acts of the sinful nature, all, all those things that, that I could be, all the things he just listed, all, the, all, all that junk, he says in contrast to that is the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is something that is produced, and it's produced by the Spirit of God. I always say this, watch out for the fake plastic fruit. You ever seen the fake plastic fruit? Some of that fake plastic fruit looks so, so real. It's even weighted. It looks like it's got the texture. Just bite it once and you'll find out. It's phony baloney stuff. I run into phony baloney people who are trying to manipulate their own human nature. They think if I do good enough that God will accept me. And that'll be my righteousness. I do good enough. And what I'm saying is what Christ did isn't good enough. I, I, I'm going to do my own goodness. All right? That's fake fruit. It's fake. It's manipulating, trying to manipulate God so that I can do good enough. Maybe, maybe I can do as good as Jesus and you'll accept me. And the thing is you can't. You have to have Jesus' righteousness. No other way. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the only way. So you got plastic fruit versus genuine fruit, which is produced by the Holy Spirit of God. When you come to know Christ, he begins working in you. Little by little, step by step, day by day, you grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord. The Spirit enables us to produce the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. Watch. Love, joy, and peace. Love. The Spirit, you see, he pours out that that love in my, my heart, and then that love kind of flows out of me. He's producing that love in me. Joy, it's better than happiness. Happiness depends on the circumstances. Joy does not depend on circumstances. It comes from God from within. Peace. The person has got all this mess in their life, the old Dennis, they got turmoil, frustration, difficulties. I live a life, oh, something goes wrong, God must be out to get me. I'm over here, it's so different. <clears throat> oh, something went wrong, God works everything together for good. I mean, it's day and night, the life. He goes on, he says, patience. That guy that cuts me off, oh, patience kicks in. I said, you know what? There's been a time or two when I was late and I had to cut somebody off. I had to change lanes because I didn't know where I was going. And I, I, I begin to become patient, kindness, goodness. Listen, he goes on. These are the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all these things. The person over here, the old Dennis, had no control. The, the flesh did whatever the flesh told it to do, and I did it. The person over here says, oh, i got to struggle. My flesh wants to do that, but, man, I read my Bible today, and God said, all right, and I follow, I follow through the prompting of the Spirit what the Lord wants me to do. And he puts this whole list here, nine different fruit. Actually, it's aspect of the same fruit. The same Holy Spirit produces this fruit. And you know, last year we went through every single one of these. I had a servant on every single one of these. 
But the part that I like is against such things there is no law. When you're doing this, you never break the law. Isn't that amazing? The Spirit of God, boom. The Spirit of God leads me to do what is right. Why is all of this stuff true that I'm telling you? Why is it true? Here's the reason. Here's the motivation for it too. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the sinful nature. When I accepted Jesus Christ, I died. You know, he said that before. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. So that was me on the cross. I died. I died. It says, I'm no longer alive. And then the very, very next verse, part of the verse, it says, but Christ lives in me. All right. He's inside me. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, he dwells in our hearts by faith. When I received Jesus Christ, he invaded me. You know, they used to say, accept, the, accept Jesus, ask Jesus to come into your heart for children. Well, I did, and he did. The Bible says he did. He's inside of me. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You see, I've been crucified with Christ, but Christ now lives in me. So he's been resurrected from the dead, and he's alive in me. I got God in me, all right? Now, the next part of the verse says this. The life I live in the body. Oh, now it says, <clears throat> whose life is this? It's my life. I live it in the body. I'm acting. It's every day I live it. I make the choice. Which one do I feed? The old nature or the new nature? Which one am I feeding? I am living the life in the body. Christ is in me. Where am I taking Jesus? Where am I taking Jesus? The last part of this verse says, and I live by faith. No, he said, the life I now live in the body I live by faith in Jesus Christ. The same faith I put in Jesus to save me from my sins, I live every day. I get up and say, thank you, God. You're, you're my Savior. Today I'm going to live for you. I, I, Lord, order my day. Organize my day. Bring people into my day. Uh, Lord, bring the difficulties you think I need to have in my day. Bring especially the blessings I need today. You, you get the picture. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That was one of our memory verses this summer, you remember, all right? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful natures. The second to last verse in this passage, with the passions and desires. He's already dealt with all the old junk in your life. You've just got to accept it. You make him Savior and Lord, okay? You follow what the Spirit's leading, not the flesh is leading. Since we live by the Spirit, he says in the last verse, uh, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Do it God's way. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Don't go to the old stuff. Don't go to the old stuff. Let me sum this all up. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. God wants us to be free. And by that, it means free to fulfill the law of Christ, which is written on your heart. He also means to overcome the sinful Nature, I don't have to be the old person that I used to be. And he says, so that I might produce the fruit of a new nature that's dependent upon the Spirit of God. All of this, I say, comes from keeping in step with the Spirit. So let's just keep in step with the Spirit. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Hope that Father makes sense. in heaven, your word is so clear that anyone who's in Christ is a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. We have been crucified with Christ, so we're no longer alive. The old Dennis is gone. Christ now lives in me. There's a new Dennis. And everyone here who has accepted Christ, they are a new person. So the life that we now live, we live every day step by step with faith in Jesus. Genuine faith. And when we do, you produce the nine fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Lord, we thank you for what the Spirit does. Bless us, Lord, going from this place to say, you know what? I'm going to live by the Spirit. And I'm going to starve the old dog and teach this new dog some new tricks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So amazing about grace. The thing that's really amazing about grace, it's for freedom. He set us free. But he set us free to love. To love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the power of Christianity. It's uh, found in that uh, we are people who love. 
I have just a couple announcements and we'll be on our way. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Gene Wilton's funeral will be held here at the church. There will be visitation from 10 a.m. to 1, and the, the funeral service itself will be at 1 o'clock with a luncheon that will follow that. Um, also, today, the scholarship board is going to be meeting in Fellowship Hall following the service. And I have a really uh, important ministry to our church that really needs some help. There's a couple of them, but this one's really important. And uh, it's coffee ministry. <laughs> we need people who say, hey, I'll volunteer to be on that team that sets up coffee, greets our, the people, you know, with a warm cup of coffee. It takes a little effort. You get here a little early, set up the coffee, afterward clean up a little bit. But it's one of those uh, hands-on tasks that you can do. It's behind the scenes. You don't have to get up in front of people and talk and all of that. But it makes major impact on people's lives. And so if you're available to do that, uh, you can see uh, myself uh, or you can let people in the office know. Just call in. And if you don't get an answer, just say on the, the machine, I'm in for the coffee ministry, okay, and, and that kind of thing. We have other ministries. We need tech people to help us in our sound uh, we're, we, you know, we've been so blessed with David and Heidi, and now, now they're gone, that uh, we got some gaping holes to fill, and we need people to say, I can step up and help. It, it, it's uh, just the same people in every week. We don't want to burn anyone out, so we need your help. If you have any technical skills whatsoever, uh, we'll help you, train you so you can get by, and we really would, would be blessed by your participation. All right? Have a wonderful Lord's Day. Our service is over. God bless you now.